everyone, and welcome to the Pash On Podcast. Let's get started with your host, Brian Pash. Hi, this is Brian Pash, and welcome to another podcast interview. I'm excited to have Vanessa Tan. She is the Senior Manager of Research and Market Intelligence at Cox Automotive. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about the big report. That's right. The Car Borrower Journey Study, the CBJ. Vanessa, this is the peak report that everyone wants to know. Thanks for being on the show. Pleasure to be here. And I'm excited that we are releasing it live today. So you have the exclusive look, Brian. Boom. I love it. Um, Before we go into the results of this year, um, members of the OEM community, the dealer community, really the, the business investment community looks toward this released report each year at a high level. Why is this report so important for dealers to to read, to understand, and to act upon? Well, I do know that dealers and OEMs, they always strategize and they try to achieve, like to deliver the best customer experience for their their base, right? And the study provides that feedback on what they're doing right and what they need to focus on to improve the purchase process for these customers. And these years, this year's results can be a bit surprising for them. Mm, See a little teaser there, Vanessa. I love that. (laughs) And I'm just going to encourage everyone who's listened, stay through this. There are some big nuggets of opportunity because here's what I want you to think about. What if Vanessa could tell you what you could do right now to make 2023 even better? And uh, for those of you who are really excited about the data, uh, don't forget also on February 22nd, Vanessa is hosting with Automotive News uh, and another webinar uh, with a lot of visuals and a lot of information on the Cox Automotive CBJ study. So Vanessa, before we talk about this year's results, can can you give us a look back? There's been a lot of changes since the pandemic, which means you have two full research studies that have been published post-pandemic before this one. Um, how would you describe the differences in journey and and the outcomes from those previous reports? You know what, that's a great loaded question, Brian. And I wanna take you through the start of the pandemic first. So think 2020, remember, yep. you know, it was it was when certain, like the laws had to pressure dealers to close, right? So they, dealers had to encourage their customers to do more digital retailing, doing more digital steps online. They were streaming, streamlining the process to make it very efficient for the customers. Also, keep in mind that year, you know, consumer confidence was a little down because of the pandemic. So people weren't sure of what was happening. So there were plenty of inventory at that time. There were discounts and dealers were very proactive. They were reaching out to customers and going, hey, are you interested in buying this vehicle? So the con- all the great conditions were there. And we saw that that really pushed uh, shopping satisfaction and dealership experience um, to, to really be really high. And people were very satisfied, right? So right. we saw that in 2020. And then come 2021, let's imagine 2021. Remember, that was the start of the chip shortage, where we saw you know, inventory levels going down because there weren't enough vehicles out there. So customers were experiencing higher prices, um, lower choices of vehicles out there. However, the process was still streamlined. Dealerships were still efficient. They were doing all these things to get the customers in and out fairly quickly, got them what they need. However, Customers were like, you know what? Prices were still high. Um, Inventory isn't so great for me, but I'm still pretty satisfied. 
And then 2022, here comes the shock. <laughs> here comes the shocker, Brian. So as I was looking through the results myself, I was a little bit ta- uh, taken back. I was just like, what's going on? We did see that shopping experience and dealership experience did decline. Um, consumers still say the prices are still too high. I don't have many choices out there. And it's taking me longer, um, longer to do the research to find the right cars, longer in which I had to spend at the dealership that I was purchasing at. So they were frustrated with all these factors in play. They, They were frustrated. And that's what I would summarize the 2022 customer base um, is like. You know, Vesa, it makes so much sense when we just step back and reflect mm-hmm. on our own car ownership journey. Hey, when we wanted a new car, we went out and got a new car. We didn't have to plan for it. We didn't have to scour the country. Of course, websites like Auto Trader and KBB have been even more critical in the consumer shopping journey because there is no uh, vehicles on the lot locally at many dealerships. But, you know, my concern, and I wonder if you have some insights here, when something changes, uh, it takes often months for new habits to form, new Mm -hmm. mindsets uh, to develop. And right now, from just the friends in my circle who know I'm in automotive, often share their frustration, how difficult it is to buy a car and how to get a good deal on a car. Now it's almost in, if I had to summarize it, it's kind of like, this is the new normal. Yet here's 2023 inventory levels are starting to pick up again, man. It seems like dealers have some uneducating to do, or they need to pivot hard because we surely don't want consumers discouraged and maybe putting off trading up or trading out their vehicles? Well, that's a great point because remember you said trading off or trading with some other vehicle with this frustration, right? During 2022, more people were cross shopping. They had to cross shop for new versus used because they had to cast a wider net. They have, they have also have to open up to other brands. For example, Brian, what if you were looking for a Honda Accord and there aren't many out there? You're going to have to look to other brands um, that would fit your needs, right? So consumers had to do more research, research in terms of these brands that they haven't thought of. Um, they had to, like you said, really search for the vehicle and work harder to, to find the right vehicle. So what I want to tell our dealerships is, hey, make sure your listings are updated, Um, find alternatives for your consumers, Um, whether it's, hey, I know you're looking for a Honda Accord of this year or this trim. Can I find another vehicle that's going to fit your needs? Those are the type of things that they can help with. Um, The other thing that they can help with, and this is an option, right, because then this is going to help improve Um, dealer loyalty, and obviously brand loyalty is, hey, Mr. Dealer can say, hey, Brian, would you like to pre-order? I know you're looking for a Honda Accord, um, and we don't have exactly what you need now, but can we help you pre-order it, put it in order, and you just wait, and you're going to get exactly what you want. And then the price is probably going to be MSRP or something that we can uh, negotiate on, but you're getting exactly what you want and exactly what you need. You know, one of the things that is a challenge for the dealers um, is this uh, rapid drop in used car prices. Um, The movement away from MSRP plus pricing, I think most of the dealers I've talked to are back to MSRP pricing for in-demand vehicles. But there's like a hangover there. There, Store managers were making record profits. And I'm trying to figure out, is there any insights that you could give the dealers listening who, you know, had had a good run in 
PBR um, at historical highs, how do they get back to the regular blocking and tackling and, and considering lifetime value of the customer uh, volume instead of trying to hit home runs on every car? I mean, it's tough to give up that gross, but it's clear that consumers have been put off by the recent, uh, you know, price inflation, whether it's real or artificial. Well, you're right. They OEMs and dealers were making record profits. Um, like you said, certain people were making uh, record money, right? However, that's the short term. Dealers and OEMs need to think about the long term because in the short term, in our study results, we did see that loyalty dr dropped. People had to consider or buy another brand or go to another dealership to find the right vehicle. So they have to go back to the foundation of it, right? And get customers back to the brand, back to their dealership. And they're going to have to balance between um, the number of vehicles that they have on the lot and having enough to satisfy what the, the customer's demands are, but then having to make the pricing um, a win-win situation for both the dealership and the consumer. So I, I want to say that that was a short-term thing and that all these people in the industry has to look at the long-term effects of it. You know, Vesa Cox um, really was one of the early pioneers in what we might call digital retailing, now connected retailing, um, and now even with uh, the new tools that are on all of KBB, AutoTrader, and Dealer.com sites with the the garage uh, wallet uh, concept, we've seemed to take in a step back. <laughs> you know, you mentioned during pandemic, if you had digital retailing tools, your dealership was shut. Everyone was trying to do as much as they can online. And then when MSRP plus pricing came, no one wanted to really show what these cars were worth. I thought we took a step back in digital retailing. It's showing in the consumer satisfaction. It's seeing in loyalty drop. But Cox has amazing tools to streamline the purchase process. What would you tell dealers who, you know, kind of backed off of that full transparency, do as much as you want online because so many of their cars had addendum stickers? You know, what would you tell them from what the consumers are telling you on, on how important price transparency and uh, streamlined frictionless experience is to the long-term health of automotive retail? You know what, that is a great question. We did a lot of research and our results do show that digital retailing tools, like you mentioned, or these e-commerce tools, when consumers partake, they're more satisfied with the dealership experience, which we talked about before. They're more satisfied with the shopping experience overall as well. We also see that those who engage more with these digital retailing tools, they are more loyal, both to the dealer as well as the brand. Ooh, that's um, a good more, one. Yeah, yeah. And they're also more satisfied with the price and the selection of inventory. So it does make sense for them. And consumers do recognize um, the benefits. And they, they, based on our research, we, we saw that they want to do that more in the future. They want to partake more. Therefore, dealers and OEMs would have to be all in with it because this is what consumers are telling us. They recognize the benefits and they will keep using these tools as long as they benefit from it and that the dealers are transparent with them. You know, uh, some of the recent data that Cox shared with me that uh, seven out of 10 auto shoppers visited a Cox Automotive site in 2022. So you have tremendous visibility into the journey. Now with the data insights dealers can have who are on the Cox ecosystem, when a lead is submitted, they can kind of know their shopping intensity score. Um, you can create marketing audiences for in-market shoppers. 
that are, um, you know, actively shopping, but it still comes down, right, to mm -hmm. making that great first impression. And, uh, you know, in the past, uh, you know, year or so, um, kind of sales processes started to break down. Like, hey, if you don't want to pay this price, go find it somewhere else. I mean, I heard that from friends of mine. Like, I can't believe I was treated like that. And I understand what was happening. You know, there was four cars on the lot and they were charging five grand over and they're like, hey, if you're not going to buy it, someone else will. But it has a lasting brand impact. When you think of all the insights Cox can deliver its dealers and well, they're, they're quite immense. What would you tell dealers to do now, right? Knowing that there's a pivot going on, pricing pivot, inventory pivot, customer loyalty pivot, customer shopping satisfaction pivot. There's a lot of moving pieces, but you get to see it all. What would you tell dealers they could do now to build back loyalty, to build back trust, to build back satisfaction in the retail experience. There has to be a few things that really are practical for dealers to implement, even though they may sound like, hey, basics of customer service. I think we forgot some of those. Well, it goes back to streamlining the process like we talked about in 2020, 2021, right? So go back to making it efficient. Figure out ways um, for your customers to save time, save time in the research, save time while they're at the dealership trying to transact. Time is money and consumers are usually frustrated if they have to work too hard for it or they have to spend too much time with, let's say, the financing application um, trying to figure out that part of it, make it easy, make it fast for them, right? So implementing, going back to these tools, um, allowing them to sign their contract digitally. Um, if they wanted to buy the vehicle wholly without even stepping into the dealership, make that possible for them because, you know, the time again, they want time efficiency and with, um, retailers that offer that, um, consumers tend to be more loyal to them and consumers tend to remember um, that great experience. And we just have to go back to that streamlined process. You know, one of the things I mentioned just a moment ago, I want to go back to the new Kelly Blue Book, My Wallet. It was uh, submitted for an AWA award consideration uh, this year. And I was very impressed by the placement that this platform took. And, you know, not every dealer wants to do or believes they should do full digital retailing on their website. And you can't force that. Um, but what I did like, if a consumer went to KBB and, and looked at a car, they could save it. If they went to Auto Trader, whatever they saved was there. And then if they went to a dealer.com uh, dealer's website and uh, whatever they saved in their wallet uh, was there. To me, that seems like really helpful when consumers are trying to find products that are maybe not so easily available. You mentioned considering other brands. A friend of mine called me up the other day, and this is a you know, true story. Um, I had gotten a, a local dealer in New Jersey, a Honda dealer, uh, they get their car and they love their Honda, but you know, it's time for a new car. And you know, the dealer didn't have any of the particular Honda in stock. And I told them, well, you probably should consider, you know, taking a look at a Hyundai or something else. And um, they defected to Hyundai and they love the Hyundai, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so when I'm thinking about consumers shopping, I'd love maybe to see a follow-up detailed study on how consumers are using tools like a persistent wallet across all these shopping sites. It just seems to me like uh, not everyone wants to do digital retailing, but everyone wants to be more organized. Not everyone 
uh, is so organized to remember prices and selection, but comparing cars side by side in the Kelly Blue Book, my wallet makes a whole lot of sense. Do, do you see consumers commenting on the use of these streamlined tools? It's as part of your recommendation set, but um, I guess there's different tools for different people. Yes. I mean, you mentioned my wallet. That is a very popular tool and people do save their, their preferences in there. Um, and you do bring up a good point about the different tools and the shopping tools um, because people are cross shopping more. They're looking at other brands. And you mentioned the Honda person who defected to Hyundai. Um, we have a, a study called the content influence study that goes into that for people who are trying to leverage different um, different content that's out there, different tools that are out there. What's what's the most relevant to them? And the the my wallet is definitely one of them, but also uh, side by side comparisons so they can save time on all the different vehicles they're considering. But the other tool, Brian, that we do have that people do leverage and they find it one of the most highly um, useful influential tool would be consumer ratings and reviews, right? Mm, yeah, so yeah. so instead of a, a customer talk uh, thinking that an expert has all the answers and, and experts do, however, when it really comes down to it, they want to hear from regular people like me and you to, that have owned, I'm going to just go back to the Honda Accord, who let's say you and I have owned one before and we go online and we capture what our experience was like, what we liked about the vehicle. And someone like me and you who did that, a consumer, um, they see as more um, objective and, and they're trusting of people who don't have skin in the game. They're just enthusiastic like we are and we're owners of the specific vehicle. So that's one of the, the content that's very highly used by consumers is this consumer ratings and reviews. Um, I, Go back to experts as well. People do want to see expert um, test drives or when experts do a walk around introducing the vehicle. That's really useful. And we see consumers saying that they like, they leverage that because it brings um, what they read to life. And videos, like video content is really helpful too, because then it explains um, how things work. Um, especially for an EV, for example, EV is still a new technology like electric vehicles. So with videos, people can get an idea of how to operate EVs, um, what to look for when they're shopping for an EV, um, what they should consider if they're trying to maintain an EV because it's a more involved purchase. So those are some of the tools, some of the content that our consumers are, are looking at and using. Um, and I mentioned this before, Brian, because they have to crush up more and they have to do more research, they're leveraging third-party sites more. They're leveraging dealer sites more. They're leveraging OEM sites more. They're just trying to get their hands on as much content and information that's going to help them make a decision. Vanessa, you know, I was, I was thinking about my friend's story and the, you know, the reality that certain dealers like Honda have had more, say, inventory challenges than others, when inventory levels start to get back to normal, don't you think uh, that dealers are going to have to invest uh, maybe extra in going back to their existing customers, those existing leads that they didn't sell to kind of re-educate that, hey, inventory levels are back, we're here to help. There, there seems to be no one talking about um, what's the message to regain <laughs> um, the American car buyer's confidence that they can walk in the lot and, and for the most part, get a car like they used to. Getting back to basics, and we talked about the digital retailing tools, and we have to get back to um, making these frustrated buyers, I keep saying the word frustrated, but making them more engaged and content again, saving time for them, efficiency. Um, like you said, 2023, 
our prediction as Cox Auto is that inventory levels will be a little bit more normalized again, right? So helping them understand that, helping them find alternatives, helping them understand if there's any um, incentives that may be um, increasing because more inventory is out there. So going back to those basics, um, making them feel like they are a loyal customer, keep them in the brand, um, keeping them engaged, being transparent. And the other thing is keep training dealership staff to know about the vehicles, um, the features, um, the bells and whistles. But another uh, layer of complexity is that with more EVs out there, mm. I would say train the dealer to know um, what incentives, whether it's at a state level or a federal level, because consumers are saying that they want to know more. And that's going back to basics as well. Well, you know, Vanessa, you bring up so many great points. As we move back to normal, dealers have to realize that there are some people who, who've been hurt through the process. They've been discouraged. Uh, some maybe feel that they were taken advantage of. Um, out of the control of the dealer, used car pricing, you know, has had the greatest fluctuations in the history of used cars. And, uh, well, you know, you can point to um, COVID relief funds or you could point to the chip shortage. These are not uh, individual things that dealers created, but we have to deal with it. And I think what's so important about this study, and and you just really hit it on the head, is that it was easy selling cars for the last 18 months. And, <laughs> and we had to get back to basics. You said a number of times, we need to understand that the consumer confidence in the shopping price process has diminished. Loyalty it has been impacted mostly because of supply and demand. And what can dealers do today is do everything that they can to make the shopping and purchasing process easy, remind the consumers about their local brand value, invest in training, be the local experts, especially with a new wave of EV cars, and go above and beyond what they have been doing in the last two years to get back to the basics of customer retention, customer communication, personalized one-to-one -one marketing. And that some people could say, hey, that's what we all should have been doing. Well, that's not what was happening. And uh, I'm glad that this report is so timely. Now, Vanessa, for the dealers who want a copy Mm -hmm. of this year's annual car buyer journey study. Where would they go to get that? Well, this is a shameless plug, Brian, but we have an automotive news webinar February 22nd. Um, they can join us on that webinar and also on our Cox, uh, Cox Auto Newsroom where they can download the, the overall study um, that they can get results to. Yeah. And the nice thing about the webinar is you're going to be able to visualize the data from this study, right? Yes. We're, be, we're going to show a deck, a presentation that takes us through the insights and the stats, and then some key takeaways that these dealerships and OEMs can work with as soon as um, they're done. Well, you heard it direct from Vanessa. This is the first time we're talking about the data from this year's study. Don't forget to mark your calendars. It's right around the corner, February 22nd, with Automotive News going into the visual presentation. And Vanessa, I want to thank you for choosing our podcast to be the first to talk about this. As people gear up for NADA, I want to remind everyone that uh, the Cox Automotive Pavilion, right? <laughs> Some, <laughs> something the, of the largest uh, in the exhibit hall each year with... The scope of Cox Automotive now, 2.3 billion online visits, 80 million leads, uh, 2.9 trillion data points for customer shopping. Make sure 
you stop by the Cox Automotive Pavilion at NADA to see some of their latest insights into the customer journey and then how to activate that data for better marketing and retention. Vanessa, thanks for being on the podcast. And I look forward to hosting you each year as we can talk about the trends in the customer journey for buying cars. And I really appreciate the depth and quality of the research that Cox does each year to help the automotive industry grow. Thank you so much. And it was such a pleasure talking to you. All right. Uh, If this is the first time you're hearing one of my podcasts, you should know that we have dozens of interviews with industry leaders, researchers, uh, groundbreaking new technology covered in our podcast. You can go to brianpash.libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N.com or go to Google Play, Apple podcast channel, just search for Brian Pash podcast and you'll find it there. And I look forward to spending time with you again on another podcast interview in the coming days.